It's really strange being back here after all these years. The place is so empty, so deserted, but you can almost feel and see the ghosts of the ghosts of history, the ghosts of the conflict. I spent a lot of time here, on and off through the 70s and the 80s and some of the some of the 90s. And it all started here in what used to be known as the compounds, which were set up at the time of internment in 1971. This place used to be a World War II RAF base, I think, and these huts were put up hastily in 1971 after the uh, disastrous internment sweep. And internment uh, sort of was indefinite at the time, and of course the compounds were segregated into loyalist compounds and republican compounds. And when you trace the history back, what the compounds did was bind together the various organizations. You'd have a UDA on the loyalist side, you'd have a UDA compound and a UVF compound. And on the republican side, you'd have a, um, a Provo provisional IRA compound and a sticky compound, <laughs> official IRA compound. And there was very little uh, interreaction between the compounds, although there was, I think, a camp committee comprising both sides who would then negotiate with the governor for improvement in conditions and things. But inside those compounds, they ran the show that the, you know, the paramilitary prisoners, because that's what they were, and they maintained they were political prisoners, uh, and I suppose if you stretch the imagination quite away, you could understand why, because everyone who was incarcerated here was in here really for a political reason. The Loyalists, because they wanted the North to remain part of the United Kingdom, and the Republicans because they wanted United Ireland. So in that sense, they were, quotes, political prisoners. Um, a lot of them had done horrendous things, which they carried out in the name of their particular cause. Uh, no doubt some of them were innocent, totally innocent, or reasonably innocent, or whatever. It's impossible, impossible to say. And they got in here through a bizarre so-called quasi-judicial process called commissions, when special branch officers would give evidence against uh, you know, Seamus or Tommy or whatever from behind a screen so they couldn't be identified. And they would say, you know, I know that uh, you know, Seamus is the... Uh, battalion commander of the 1st Battalion in West Belfast or whatever and on the say of that then the commissioners would say you know off you go to um, down to the Kesh because this used to be called of course Long Kesh not the Maze Prison. They changed the name to the Maze uh, because they wanted to um, you know wipe out the notion of Long Kesh and all its connotations which were really Republican connotations and uh, they called it the maze, hoping that people would forget about Long Kesh, forget about all this, because no one, no one ever did. And it became the maze, again for political uh, presentational reasons, at the time when um, Merlin Rees was succeeded by uh, Labour's uh, Northern Ireland Secretary, Roy Mason. And Mason hit the probers really hard, and part of the so-called criminalisation process in which uh, the, the British government insisted that the people in here were not political prisoners or prisoners of war but they were common common criminals so the name of the prison was changed from Long Kesh to the maze hoping it would draw a line under the past and mark a new beginning of course it did anything but because it leads on to the hunger strike and everything else that we'll talk about talk about a bit later and I was um, well before I talk a bit about <laughs> What I did here. Let's go and have a look inside of uh, one of the one of the huts, and this one. These are the cubicles where the prisoners slept. Unfortunately, today there are no graffiti on the walls, no memorabilia, nothing. It's just empty. Just the just the echo of my voice and the echoes of the people who were here. And just walking along here, it reminds me of uh, cubicles in an English public school boarding school. Not that I went to an English public school boarding school. Uh, and the prisoners would each have their little private cubicle where they could uh, read or do whatever they wanted. But 
These Nissen huts and the cages, they were called cages, were run along, along military lines that each cage or each hut had its, had its commander and there was a routine and they ran it like the prisoners of war ran the camps in, uh, in Germany, prisoner of war camps, POW camps in World War II. So there was a structure, they would get up in the mornings, they'd have uh, a roll call, they'd have a parade, they'd then have uh, activities, they'd have lectures and the lectures, certainly as far as the Republicans were concerned, would invariably be about, uh, about politics, about the struggle, about struggles, so-called struggles, in inverted commas in other parts of the world. They would study the ANC's fight in South Africa, the Sandinistas, you name it, and they studied it. And they would read, certainly on the, on the, the Republican library would be full of uh, things like Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth and all the revolutionary literature, Marx, Lenin, and everything else. The Loyalists, interestingly, in the time I spent here, um, this was after the, uh, all the, the cages and long cash had been um, abolished when I was in the wings. I noticed that uh, you know, the Republicans' reading material was all political. Uh, there were no sexist posters on the wall or anything like that. You went into the Loyalist wings and uh, their, their cells were covered in, not covered in, but uh, lots of uh, you know, pin-ups, page three, that sort of stuff. You would never see that in the, uh, in the Republican wings because it was deemed to be sexist and uh, not, not something that was worthy of, uh, worthy of Republicans. But soon all this will be gone and it's just really important that people have got the opportunity to see what it was like and to talk to many of the prisoners who spent a number of years here, many years in some cases, and they were formative years because the politicization of the prisoners took root here, in particular on the, on the IRA side, but on the loyalist side too, because if you're incarcerated here, you have to believe that you're here for, for a reason, and those reasons were because you wanted a united island and were prepared to fight for it and kick the Brits out, the occupying forces of the north as they were seen, and for loyalists, because you were determined to maintain that this didn't happen and that um, Northern Ireland uh, remained part of the United Kingdom. So this is where they slept. Let's go and have a look, uh, have a look outside. And I think uh, next door wasn't exactly five star accommodation rather 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 than than me uh, we can fight our way through the undergrowth this is where the prisoners would come to a blute to wash to shower to go to the loo and all the facilities were there you can still see the uh, little soap dishes I wonder who washed in this one and it was, it was pretty basic, pretty basic. Let's go and have a look out outside and get a bit of fresh air. And I think having talked to many prisoners who spent time here in the compounds, in a strange kind of way, they, they enjoyed it. I wrote the introduction to one of the chapters in my provost book about a visit here and, and what my reactions were and this would be uh, I think I wrote this in the mid 90s and I say it'd be rather strange reading this in this situation now remarkably the compounds or cages of long cash still stand today like a disused film set, and that's exactly what it's like, a disused film set. It looks like it's been trashed by the prisoners. Wandering amongst them is like walking back into history. The Nissen huts are bare, but for the odd metal chair left abandoned in the middle and the empty tin of smash instant potato, remember smash? Dreadful stuff. Rattling around in the wind. On the wall of one hut is a fading list of prisoners. T.W brackets, Cleeky Clark, number 674. These are the ghosts of the past. 
Perhaps some Northern Ireland official had ordered the compounds to be spared the bulldozer in case one day when peace finally came, Long Kesh might become a museum. Uh, and I hope that's what uh, does happen because this, this place, this site, this history, these memories are just far, far too important to be uh, you know, brushed aside. A guide might point out where the tunnels had been built, because of course there were several escapes, real and, uh, uh, and attempted. I'd made, well, I don't know how many, a dozen films or more on, um, on the conflict. I, my introduction was uh, the Bloody Sunday, that was the first time I, I came over to Ireland and was in Derry very late on, uh, on that day. But in 77 I made a film called Life Behind the Wire. And the wire, this is the wire here, and it was what was going on in the compounds. And then I came back <coughs> fairly soon after that, when the uh, Republican prisoners, the IRA, well, IRA and, and official IRA, began the blanket protest. Because after um, Longkesh became the maze, and the process of criminalise what was called criminalisation began when Roy Mason and the then Labour government, I think we're talking about 1975, 1976, when these compounds were closed down and they were all put into the H blocks. The, the reason for it was the uh, redefinition <coughs> of the prisoners as, as criminals and the process by which they came here that I did a lot of work on, which was via interrogation at Castlereagh and other interrogation centres, although they euphemistically were called by the RUC holding centres. Uh, prisoners on both sides were interrogated, uh, signed uh, confessions, and that in most cases was sufficient evidence to bring them over here and, uh, and bang them up. So the government argued that they were criminals, they had been, uh, they had gone through due process of law, uh, and they had been found guilty by the courts, just like ordinary criminals, and here they were as criminals. And of course, the, <laughs> the prisoners just refused to accept that. And it is a fact that uh, during this time, we're talking mid-late 70s, uh, a good many of those prisoners signed confessions because they'd been beaten up in custody. And I, I, I wrote a book about it and um, called Beating the Terrorist that caused quite a fuss and uh, made, a, made a television this week programme about it. But that was part of the criminalisation process and of course the prisoners just uh, you know, refused to accept that and of course that leads on to the blanket protest and then subsequently the so-called no wash protest, the dirty protest and then of course to the hunger strike which is one of you know, the great watersheds which I'll, 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 talk, about, uh, I'll talk about later.
strange feeling coming back here and seeing the compounds, the cages, where it all began after internment in 1971. And you can see why <coughs> the prisoners referred to it and their organisations referred to it as a, as a prisoner of war camp because these huts that you see behind the wire are just like the, the POW prisoner of war uh, huts from, from World War II in Germany and the prisoners inside conducted themselves like uh, you know, British POWs conducted themselves when they were imprisoned in camps behind the wire in Germany during, uh, during World War II. And coming back is, uh, is quite an experience to think that in a few months time they'll all be gone and although the the huts may be gone, the compounds may be gone, and the wires may be gone. The memories certainly won't be gone. Not least memories of those who spent many years behind the wire. They were years that were formative for so many of them. And now it's just weeds, It's surprising how quickly <laughs> all, the, uh, all the weeds, I was going to call them flowers, but they're not really flowers, grow up. They used to have, uh, they used to have gardening, gardening clubs inside and they would, uh, they would tend the flower beds and they ran, a, they ran a pretty tight ship, but they had recreation time as well. <coughs> and this is... Uh, where the cubicles, these are the cubicles where the prisoners lived and slept and had some kind of, some kind of privacy. <clears throat> but it wasn't, wasn't much of a life. Here you can see wallpaper, <laughs> wallpaper, gosh. of the time, of the era. But they all had their routines. They would get up in the morning, they would have parade, inspection, and they'd have breakfast, and then they'd have lectures and exercises, and they'd go into the, <coughs> into the yard outside and march up and down and play football, all those sort of things. and they'd be watched from over there by the guards or they'd be military actually in the, in the watchtowers. This really brings it all back. It's uh, now nearly 20 years since I did the documentary Enemies Within. Every morning we used to come here we were filming over about two or three weeks, I think. We used to come here and having gone through the endless security and I can hear the sound of the gates going wah, 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 all the gates being opened to let us through into the inner sanctum, which is, of course, this and this, uh, these, these were the H blocks. Strange to hear the echo now because it's just so empty. And all along the walls, where the cells in the H block, you can see the bars, they're not really bars, they're sort of concrete. Not metal bars, concrete bars. We used to come in here with all our gear, and chat to the prison officers in the circle just inside here, and then go on to the wings. And the remarkable thing was that we had no minder Nobody from the NIO or no prison officer with us on the wings. We were just given total access to the wings to talk to whoever we wanted to talk to. We obviously got clearance from the various organisations both outside and within the prison. And we just had unfettered access to both the Republican and Loyalist wings. At some stage the uh, 
loyalist prisoner Billy Wright, who was notorious, uh, was was here, and Billy Wright was shot dead by two INLA Republican prisoners as he was getting into the van. And there was a subsequent inquiry, and there were the predictable allegations of collusion and MI5 and rubbing out Billy Wright, the whole thing being planned and everything else, which I'm pretty sure didn't happen. I think Billy Wright was killed by the INLA because they hated Billy Wright's guts. And when I was making the documentary, I obviously did a lot of interviews with uh, you know, IRA and, and loyalist prisoners. And I spent a lot of time not doing the filming, but just talking to prisoners in their cells about their lives and their thoughts and their families and their histories and that kind of stuff. And whenever I go into uh, anybody's room when I'm working and I'm meeting people, I always look at the bookshelves and their ornaments and their memorabilia or whatever. And in one particular cell, in a, an IRA block, I was talking to a young prisoner called uh, uh, Eamon McDermott, who was from Derry. And uh, his father was a doctor, and I subsequently got to know his family well, and his brothers, and Eamon is now, or was, probably still is, working for the Derry Journal as a journalist. But Raymond was doing, um, sorry, Eamon, Eamon was doing life for murder, and the walls of his cell were lined with books. And as I tend to do, I you know, looked at the books because what people read tends to say something about them. And I noticed on his bookshelf was, were a lot of, 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 of classics, uh, classic literature, uh, War and Peace, Tolstoy, um, under the Greenwood Tree, I think it was Under the Greenwood Tree, Thomas Hardy, and a whole range of Shakespeare, that sort of stuff. And I always remember sitting on the bed talking to, this was filming, talking to Eamon McDermott. And, and he said when he was in lockup, lockup was after lunch and into mid afternoon when all the cells were locked and the prisoners spent time with themselves in their cells. He said during lockup, he just used to read. He was an avid, avid reader. And I said to him, what's an IRA man doing reading Tolstoy and Hardy? Which is you know, one of the sillier questions, but the point of questions is to get answers. And Raymond looked at me and screwed up his eyes and said, because an IRA man is normal, just like everybody else. And I always remember that, Eamon reading Tolstoy and Hardy. When I was in Derry once, it was his birthday, that's right. So I went to the local bookshop and got him a copy of War and Peace and uh, Tess of the Durbervilles by Thomas Hardy, I think, and sent them to him as a memento. An IRA man is normal, just like everybody else. Of course, the answer to that, the corollary to that, is that not everybody else goes around killing people.
the hunger strike and Bobby Sands died in May 1981, which I remember covering. And I never thought that um, Bobby Sands would go through with it. But Sands had no doubts, and his, um, his colleagues, his comrades had no doubts. And Bobby Sands' death was, I think, one of the great watersheds of the conflict. And it was no ordinary death, and Sands was no ordinary prisoner, no ordinary man, because he was an elected member of Parliament. And it was a combination of his readiness to sacrifice his life for the cause in which he believed, plus the fact that he had been elected to Westminster in London, democratically elected, that raised the level of the conflict and the level of understanding of the Republican cause to an entirely different level. And of course, nine more hunger strikers died after Bobby Sands. And it is the great watershed, the great pivot of the conflict. And this is where Bobby Sands died in the hospital wing. And I understand that several links have been taken away as souvenirs by Republicans who recognize the significance of what, uh, of what Bobby Sands MP did. And it was in this wing that 10 men died. And so second time around, despite the IRA's objections, because the IRA did not want hunger strikers to go on hunger strike at this stage because they thought it would interfere with their military campaign. But they couldn't tell the prisoners not to because had they done so, the prisoners would have gone ahead anyway.